Raiders FTC Team 7129 and I am joined by John and Sylvia, two FTC graduates and we will be discussing the top couple of things a rookie FTC team should know. What should you do at the start of the season? First off, before you get all hyped up and super excited about the game and everything that's going to be happening there and how you can solve all the different problems, number one thing you need to do is read the game manual read the game manual, and then read the game manual again. You're going to have all sorts of questions. Can we do this? Is this legal? The game manual is going to have those answers. If for some reason it doesn't because you're thinking completely out of the box and you figured out a way to break the game, go to the forums. The forums will have the answers for you. Post that question in as general as a term as you can in order to get the answer that you're aiming for, and the folks on there will say, yes, you can do that, or no, you can't do that because of this part of the game manual and they will help you understand so that before you get to competition, you know whether what you're doing is allowed or not. We see a lot of teams show up at competition with a strategy that's built on something that is either not legal at all or borderline legal, and they, they have to completely change their strategy at competition. You don't want to be there. Um, the other thing that you should do is document all of your ideas from the very beginning. Write down all of your ideas, but recognize that at the beginning of the season, most of your ideas are going to suck. Be okay with that because those terrible ideas that you have at the beginning are going to morph into the better ideas that you will have later on in the season. So write down everything that you come up with because you want to be able to go back to those ideas and be able to spiral off of them when your first idea doesn't work. You also want to document why you went with the decision that you went with because when you go back to the drawing board after your first design fails or just after you want to make it better for your next competition, you're going to not want to reinvent the wheel and go back through the process that you went through already. You'll be surprised how many things you will forget if you don't document your stuff. And here's the other thing on that. Two weeks later, as you're realizing, oh hey, we got too excited about building the robot and we forgot to document anything, you're not going to remember half the steps that you went through at the beginning. And those are an incredibly important part of your journey through the first program, through FTC, making sure you know where you did and why you did it. What would you say are some important outlooks or mindsets to have throughout the season? Um, number one is to debate ideas, not people. You have to be able to have um, clear and honest communication on your team because, again, most of your ideas at the beginning are going to suck. And you need to be able to say, hey, you can't put a water pistol on your robot to shoot at other teams' um, electronics and disable them. Not only is that against most of the game rules, but it's also very not great and professional. Yes, we've had this idea on our team and had to honestly and lovingly and graciously professionally say, no, we're not doing that. You have to have that kind of communication, but you also have to do it in a way that doesn't attack your other teammates and doesn't break their spirits and doesn't keep them from bringing up other ideas in the future because you never know who's going to have that great idea that's going to win you your entire season. Um, you also need to um, be able to give each other the terrible ideas that allow you to bounce off and say, okay, so it, didn't, it wouldn't work because of this, but if we tweaked it this way, then all of a sudden it works. And that feeds right into the one I have, comes to my mind. On the team, none of you are as smart as all of you together. There's a reason you're a team. There's a reason all of you are in this. You're going to be building on each other's ideas in order to build something that actually forms into a robot that's competition worthy. Whether it's good competition worthy or excellent competition worthy is a different question, but you're going to be building on each other's ideas. And what we just discussed here, these are not ideas that are exclusively good for rookie teams. This is a concept that you want to have as your six-year team, as your ten-year team. You just keep going and going and going and you build off of each other's ideas and the best teams are able to do that. Not only in FTC, but this is a concept worldwide in business and other aspects of society. If you're able to work with other people and build on their ideas and honestly assess their ideas without attacking the individual. And to be able to take that and take criticism and not take it personally. Exactly. You're able to build up to the best solution that you can come to with the information you have available. Once you're ready to start prototyping and building a robot, what advice would you give to rookie teams starting to do that? So the very first thing, right out of the gate, prototype quickly and then be ready to pivot quickly. 
You need to get an idea out there in front of you so you can see how it manipulates the game elements. Don't try and go and build 3D printed block grabbers. Do cardboard first. It doesn't take hardly any time to go and chop up a cardboard box, put the flappers together, and see, okay, is it going to lift? Is this a concept that's going to work? Or is it an absolutely terrible idea that we need to go with something completely different? Because we've had those. We spent a lot of time our first season spinning our wheels, trying to get an idea that if we had just prototyped, grab a plastic bottle, a two liter, chop it up, use it as a basket, whatever. Use the materials you have available to be able to prototype quickly and so you can determine, yes, this is gonna work or no, this isn't. Once you have the idea, all right, I think it's gonna work this way. Then go ahead and transfer that into a CAD model, a computer-aided design, so that you can go ahead and build out those precision measurements that you need to. If you spend your time right out of the gate doing CAD, you're gonna spend a lot of time discovering an idea that's probably not gonna work. Because this is an iterative design process. You do it over and over and over as you make a better design and a better design and a better design, and you learn to tweak this and throw at this and add stuff in. It's gonna get you way closer to where you need to go but you've got to start fast and be ready to pivot quickly. Don't fall in love with your ideas. They will slow you down and make it so you can't honestly evaluate, is this going to move us forward? Or was this an idea that probably shouldn't have made it to competition? And with the prototypes, make sure that you prototype it with the rest of your robot. It's so heartbreaking to spend tons of time building this component and then find out that you didn't measure the actual robot and it doesn't fit. Oh, don't do that. Um, also, look for ideas from pre-existing designs and don't be innovative just to be innovative. Make sure that you are choosing a design because it works the best for you, not because it is the most creative thing that you could come up with. Creativity is great, but don't reinvent the wheel. Um, make sure that you're coming up with ideas, but you're not just coming up with ideas. You're actually trying to solve a problem. You're not trying to be the most creative. Because that's not what the judges are looking for and that's not what's going to work the best. It's fine to use another team's idea, especially if they put it out there for a rookie team. That's what it's there for. And then you can take that as your base model. You can tweak it. You can change it. You can iterate it. You can make it your own. It's going to be way better than if you try to do everything um, uniquely. There are just a couple of types of wheels for a reason. You don't have to 3D print your super cool wheels just so you're the only team with those wheels in the competition. Make sure that your design is designed for a purpose, and that purpose is not just to be special. If you go and 3D print your wheels, you'll probably be the only team at competition to have a wheel break. <laughs> There's that. You don't want that kind of uniqueness. <laughs> exactly. The last thing that I would say on this one is go ahead and document as you go along. It's important to document at the beginning, but start strong and continue strong. Uh, the judges will be looking to see what your thought process was as you're going through the middle of your season, as well as the beginning and the end. Um, the middle tends to be the part where, oh, we're so excited right out of the gate, and then we it starts to lose some of the cool newness of documenting, of building a robot. All of a sudden, we start getting slowed down by the challenges that we encounter. This is true everywhere, by the way. So if you can conquer it here, you're gonna be a huge leg up throughout the rest of your life. It's incredibly important that you guys focus on staying strong through the middle. But document as you go along, and then when you come to the point where you're ready to say, okay, this idea didn't work, and we're a month and a half in, it's not working because of these reasons. Go back and look at your original documentation, and you can say, okay, I, we liked it because of these three reasons, but two of those reasons are no longer important because we have a new rule from the forums. Okay, now we're going to have to pivot. Be ready to know why you're making that change and document it. The judges will be so impressed to see, oh hey, they didn't just willy-nilly change because they saw another team on the internet who built this great robot and now they're two months in and they're twisting everything up. No, make sure that you have a reasoning and a path behind it. And documenting that is going to help you to have more of a reasoning in a path. If you're writing this down and you'll, you're going to suddenly realize, hey, this is a terrible reason. Why are we changing this? Hey, we need to go back. We need to actually think through this because do we really need to scrap our design or can we change this component 
and make the whole thing work. Documenting not just helps you remember, but it also helps you think through it better in the moment and be more logical in your decision making. Exactly. And with that, you're able to um, realize not just, hey, this is a terrible idea, but oh my goodness, this is a great idea because it solves these other problems that we kind of brushed over at the beginning. It fits these criteria that we hadn't realized were as important as they really are. At qualifying competitions, teams compete in robot challenges and also compete for awards from the judges. What advice would you give to teams trying to be competitive in both? So I'm going to speak not as an alum, but as a judge here, because I've judged at several competitions. Um, number one, there, there are basically three things that we look for as judges. Number one is the award criteria. So make sure you read the award criteria, and it is totally okay to brace your presentation. By the way, do have a presentation. Please have a presentation. You can say things so much better on your own terms than with a question that you can never fully anticipate. So have a presentation. But um, the award criteria, make sure that you read that, and it is okay to base your presentation off of it, and to just kind of go through and check the boxes and say, we fulfill this because of this, we fulfill this because of this, we fulfill this because of this. It makes our job as judges easier, and it shows that you actually did your research and that you are trying to go for these awards. And that's, that's really good. We usually see the top teams doing this kind of a thing in judging. Um, number two that we look for as judges is how does your team um, communicate? How does your team be a team? It's not something that we're looking to penalize you for. So if one team member is just having a bad day, we're not going to penalize the whole team for that. If you blank on a question and just can't answer, and someone else steps in and can't quite answer it, we're not going to penalize you for that either. What we're looking for is does everyone have something to contribute? Do you guys treat each other with respect? And do you value each other's input, or are you criticizing each other's answers? or just kind of, you know, giving that side eye, that was a terrible answer. We're looking for that kind of a thing much more than the perfection or the smoothness of your answers. Um, are you being gracious professional with each other? Just to tag in on there, uh, when you're talking one uh, as a team, we're judging you as you're working as a team, it's really important to be able to see how you interact as a team. So one jumping in to help fill in. What we like, we like to call it popcorning on the answers. One answer goes out there and then boop, 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 boop. And it's, it's not like it's scripted or anything, but one person answers and then there's an additional aspect that we can add and one more aspect that we can add. And normally we try and see two or three people answer a question uh, because often the first person to answer is not gonna be able to cover everything. You're under pressure. You're under pressure, you can't cover everything, you may not know everything. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is if only one person does give the whole answer, we as judges start to be a little bit concerned if that's the pattern throughout. Mm -hmm. It's like, why is, is it, it that... Is it just a script? Is this your question and nobody else is allowed to touch it? Exactly. Can, is only one person able to answer this question and you didn't share information well as your team? Mm -hmm. All these, we aren't able to necessarily say yes or no. You're a winner based off of this. But it feeds into that. It absolutely feeds into that. And so we're not looking for everyone has to have this in-depth knowledge of code on your team. That's fine. You can have specializations, but do you share your information? Do you make decisions based on a team? And also with the popcorning, um, if your team has is feels comfortable enough with each other to do that, that says a lot about how you work together. Um, the other thing was, oh yes, memorize. That's the third thing. Um, one of the most common questions you're going to be asked in judging is, what does gracious professionalism mean to you? Um, gracious professionalism sets first apart from most other competitions based on robotics. This isn't BattleBots. First is special because of gracious professionalism. And so you guys, as FTCers, need to know what gracious professionalism means. We see a lot of teams come in and judging, and that's the question that they fumble. And it just, it's really sad. So make sure that you as a team sit down and have every single person ready to answer that question. You can either have a special team answer, which is what we did when we were on the team. We had a whole code of ethics based on gracious professionalism, and, and that's what it meant to our team. Or you can do something that's individual. Gracious professionalism means this to me because of this. But have something that shows that it's actually heartfelt. You didn't just memorize a definition. You are a gracious professional team, and that will make a bigger difference than you could ever imagine in judging. Of course. 
you can say that you're a gracious professional team, but if you aren't acting it, yes. <laughs> it's going to completely come back and bite you. So with this, obviously, yes, be real. And this is what you should be striving for. You want to be the team that the other teams like to hang out with. They want you on their alliance, not just because you have a good robot, but because you work well with others. And Gracious Professionalism ex extends not only to your teammates, but also to your competitors. The other teams there are on competition. Hey, I have a part. Or hey, we need a part. Does anybody have it? Boom, we got it right here. We're not going to hold back. And the judges will hear about that. Yes. Just so you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, taking a look at it from a non-judge perspective here. Most important thing you can do, come to a competition already having driven your robot, having practiced with it, know how to manipulate it, know how your autonomous works. Don't be coding on the fly when you're at competition. Please. <laughs> your other Alliance teams will thank you for it. The people resetting the field will thank you for it. Everybody will enjoy the competition more if this is not your first rodeo with that robot. That being said, if you've practiced with your robot, you also likely know where your robot is going to fail. And so, where are the weak points on it? How are you going to repair those weak points? If a wheel comes loose and falls off in the middle of competition, hmm, had that happen, how are you going to get it back together? Please have the extra parts. Yes, have the extra parts, have the tools that you need. Make sure you're able to get it all back together quickly some of these matches will be very fast turnarounds and if you're not ready if you have built it so that you have to take half your robot apart in order to tighten the screws that was not a good design it may be the coolest design out there it's not a good design if it takes you forever to maintenance it maintenance is important and you need to be prepared for it with the parts and knowing who is going to repair that robot mm -hmm. also <laughs> please don't be like us so there is a very special picture from our very first year Oof. as an FTC team. There are two people over this robot. They have a hacksaw and they are sawing off the arm of the robot. This was our second match. It was our second match of the day. The robot completely <laughs> broke, leaving it in a... Permanently extended position so it didn't fit into the 18 inch cube. And as you know, you can't compete unless your robot fits into the 18 inch cube. So we had a match in 20 minutes. So we, they, they tried to take it apart and it was not going. So they had to, they took it out, hacksawed <laughs> it off. And we went throughout the rest of the competition without that functionality. That was the only thing we could do at that competition. <laughs> we were just driving around basically playing defense the whole time. It was not a fun experience. So please be ready to maintenance. Be ready to maintenance. Be ready in case stuff goes wrong. And apparently have a hacksaw. And, and hopefully not. <laughs> Design your robots so you don't need a hacksaw. Yes. <laughs> so there's obviously a lot of advice you can't impart in this video, but what would you say out of all the options we haven't discussed, what would you say are the top five things any rookie FTC team should know? Right out of the gate, don't try and do it all. There's a lot on the field that you could potentially do. There's a lot in the judging room that you could potentially do. You don't have the time or the resources as a first year team to be able to do them all. If you try and do them all, you might manage it and do them all poorly. If instead you focus on just a couple areas, in general they tend to be autonomous and endgame, and do those well, you will far surpass what others are able to do or what you might expect to see otherwise as a first year team. Especially a qualifier. Especially a qualifier. If you can manage a decent autonomous and a decent end game, you're Oops, good there. <laughs> so very similar to that, um, know your strengths as a team and be ready to highlight those to the judges, to really play those up when you're trying to get on an alliance, and to put a lot of effort into those to make them the best that you possibly can be. And then similar to that, I'm going to talk to the girls here. Um, as girls on robotics teams, especially if you're the only girl on the team like I was, you're going to have a lot of pressure on you to do and be the STEM girl. And the STEM girl is great. If you are the coder chick, good for you. You're smart. Go for it. If you're not the coder chick, please don't try and be the coder chick. You are an individual, not a STEM girl. You have your own strengths, you have your own weaknesses, and you have something that no one else can bring to the team. 
please take ownership of that and don't let the people who tell you that you should be doing this and you should be doing that who don't really know you don't let them tell you what you need to be doing um, you know better than anyone else what your strengths are and your teammates hopefully should know that as well be willing to stand up for that be willing to say I'm not comfortable doing this I'm if you give me the drive coach I will do okay, but if I am the driver, I'm going to freeze up and panic, and it's not going to be good for anyone. If you are someone who loves to do marketing, if you're someone who loves to do documentation, if you are just really good at talking to sponsors, be willing to advocate for yourself to do those roles, or be willing to advocate for yourself to be a coder, or to be a fabricator, or whatever your strengths are, but know who you are as an individual, and don't try to fit into whatever mold it is. Know your strengths as a team, and as individuals, especially you girls. Absolutely. Moving now a little bit more into the tactical side of it, how do we handle the day of the day on the team? Um, competition comes out, the game manual comes out on a specific day, and from that point to competition, you can map out the weeks, you can count out the days if you wanted. Build a schedule. Know where you have milestones along your journey so that by the end of week, I'm making up numbers at this point, by the end of week five, we want to have a working drivetrain. By the end of week eight, we want to have our first actuator, our first arm, whatever, working. By the end of week 12, we want to be able, that's three months in by the way, the end of week 12, you tend to be about the beginning of December. By that point in time, we want to have a drive a robot that we can drive and practice with and program. Please make sure that you are dedicating time to programming. Schedule it out. We need to have it ready by this point in time. Things are going to take longer and they're going to cost more, which is the rule across life. They're going to take longer, they're going to cost more, and you're not going to be ready when you need to, but you need to prepare as much as you can. Move on the schedule. Stick to the schedule. Be ready to be at competition. And similar to that, um, when you have your schedule all out, make sure that you have someone who is going to hold others accountable and who is going to be responsible for each of those deadlines. This is not the person who is going to do all the work to make those deadlines. And speaking as someone who would prefer to do the work myself and know that it's going to get done right, instead of holding other people's feet to the fire, you have to be willing to hold other people's feet to the fire, and you have to be willing to have your feet held to the fire by your other teammates. So make sure that someone is accountable for each deadline to make sure that it happens. And make sure that you're willing to each um, bring your part in. So this person needs to have this done by this date. This person needs to have this done by this date. And this person is going to make sure that they have their part done and that these people have their parts done so that you have this part ready to go by competition. And um, unfortunately for you programmers, you guys tend to get the short end of the stick if this doesn't happen. So I would encourage all programmer people to make sure that you have, that you are able to say how much time you're going to need to program and say that this is the hard cutoff. The robot has to be built by this time. You can make your little tweaks, but it can't be anything major because after this date, the robot belongs to the programming team because we have to sleep sometime. You cannot do unlimited things on two hours and caffeine. So make sure you have your deadlines, make sure you have people to be responsible for those deadlines, and make sure that one person, especially in terms of the lead programmer doing everything in the two hours before competition, somebody is not there doing everything. It's a team effort. And building off of that, you're not um, just existing in a vacuum. You have mentors, you have coaches for a reason. What we just described here, holding people's feet to the fire and accountable, that's a hard thing to do. So, so don't think that that is um, it's just going to happen overnight. It's not going to work the first time. It's not going to work the few first times. But work with your mentors, your coaches, in order to help you to be able to have those conversations in a good situation. We want one person to own the project, but the one person isn't supposed to do the project. Um, Build it all in, you have a team for a reason, um, and go forward from there. The last thing that we want to hit on, and this is the most important thing across all of FIRST, have fun. You are having the opportunity to build robots, to compete ro with robots. 
and you're in middle school or high school, what kind of an opportunity is that? It's fantastic. 25 years ago, this wasn't a thing. And now we're able to do that. We're prepping for the future. We're not just solving this little problem with the robot. We're building people in first to be able to go and have a better society. That's really what this is. You're building yourself and your teammates up to be better individuals, to be better at interacting with the business community, with all of society. We're solving real world problems and giving you skills. Interacting with people is huge. You have no idea how much we both learned just from our time in first and how it has catapulted us into life. But it's all a mindset thing. You can have fun or you can just feel like, oh, I have to do robotics because it's what my school is doing. Or I, I, have, to go to comp I have to go to practice because the robot's not finished yet. Or this or that or the other. You can come up with all sorts of excuses, but at the end, it's an opportunity. It's a lot of fun, too. There are definitely times where it's going to be stressful. There are going to be times where you're going to wish that you signed up for butterfly catching class instead. So it would be less stressful. But as he said, it's an opportunity. And so when you get to competition, I'm sure you'll be sleep deprived. You'll be on a ton of caffeine. You'll be excited. You'll be stressed. Try to leave that stress behind you. Try to enjoy the competition. Try to be gracious with yourself and with your teammates and not stress over every small failure because every team and every individual is going to have some sort of a failure on the day. Just get it over with and don't stress about it. Be willing to laugh at yourself and laugh at your mistakes and be willing to learn from your mistakes as well. Um, know that the second competition is always going to go better than the first and the third competition is going to go better than that and that no matter how the competitions go, if you had the attitude of learning something, you are going to get so much out of first. Even if your team doesn't win Inspire, even if you don't make it to Worlds, FIRST is an incredible, incredible program that is going to do more than you could ever dream for the rest of your life. You're going to learn team skills, you're going to learn technical skills, you're going to learn soft skills and speech skills. There are so many things that you won't even realize you have until you get out into the job world and you see other adults struggling with these things that you learned as a high schooler. So enjoy the competition, enjoy what you're learning, have fun, and learn a ton. Thank you very much for coming out. It's a pleasure. Thank you for watching this video, giving you some tips for your rookie year. With John and Sylvia Phillips, two FTC graduates. This is our second video in our Game On series, and next week's video will be on game strategy. Stay tuned. Bye.